Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael LaMagna, and I want to welcome you to TCLC's third webinar for the spring 2017 semester. This webinar is part of a pilot project to bring the excellent professional development programming that TCLC is known for to the online environment. This pilot project is part of an LSTA TRIAT grant made possible by a grant from the Institute of Museums and Library Services as administered by the Pennsylvania Department of Education through the Office of Commonwealth Libraries and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. This webinar will be recorded and made available to all in attendance, the TCLC community, and the general public on TCLC's YouTube channel. When the recording is available, an announcement will be made on the TCLC listserv. Now, the digital learning arts is a concept of increasing importance and interest for college and university libraries. Um, this afternoon, Diane Scarina will discuss the concept of digital learning arts and discuss how libraries can support digital projects using Ursinus College as a case study. I'd like to welcome Diane Scarina. She is a librarian and the Director of Research, Teaching, and Learning Services in Library and Information Technology Department at Ursinus College. See, she is also the co-director of the Teaching and Learning Institute. Diane received her Master of Library Science from Drexel University in 2004 and her Bachelor's of Art in English from the University of Pennsylvania in 2000. She attended the, the Leading Change Institute in 2013. Because she really loves libraries, she also serves on the board of Spring City Public Library. Diane will answer questions towards the end, end of the webinar today, so please post your questions using the question feature in the GoToWebinar control panel. I will turn things over to Diane now. Thank you for that introduction, Michael. Um, I'm very glad to be here talking to everybody. It's a little nerve-wracking to just be in my office, but talking to people out there. So um, bear with me. This is new for me, but I'm very excited to be participating in this. I wanted to briefly say hi to everybody, so I'm going to webcam for a minute um, so that everybody can see me. Hi for those of you that I don't know for um, uh, my name is, as Michael said, Diane Scarina. I am the Director of Research Teaching and Learning Services in LIT. So what's important about that for the purposes of our presentation today is that we are at Ursinus a merged library and IT organization. So that helps a lot with um, supporting the digital liberal arts. And if you're not a merged organization, it can also, though, it's just really good to have good relationships with the IT department. The other, the other part of my role here, uh, since the beginning of this academic year, I've been the co-director of the Teaching and Learning Institute, which gives me a whole different perspective on pedagogy and teaching and learning and what's going on in higher ed. So that is a perspective I hope I can bring to this, and I will talk more about that a little bit, um, sort of more towards the end of the presentation. So um, thank you uh, for coming. I'm gonna sign, I'm gonna take off my webcam now so that I can uh, be more, a little more comfortable and won't distract. So okay, so what we're gonna do today is talk about. Um, the three, the three sort of learning objectives I put in my um, my description were to understand more about what the term digital liberal arts um, means and current trends related to it. Um, I want to talk a lot about some specific digital liberal arts projects here at Ursinus and how the LIT department is supporting them. And I also want, by the end, at the end, to discuss some ways that TCLC libraries might collaborate on a digital liberal arts project that highlights the TCLC organization. So hopefully, if some of you are interested in that, this will be a, a sort of conversation starter. Um, so let me go to the next slide here. I wanted to start with a pop quiz, not really, but I wanted to know what how you guys in the audience would define the digital liberal arts. So if you could, in, in the questions or the chat box, I'm not quite sure where this will be, um, if you could type your own definitions or without going out to the, to the internet um, of digital liberal arts or what you think it might be or how you would talk about it, 
um, post them, and I'm going to try to post them in the uh, in the slide here. I've got one so far. So somebody suggested using technology to create interdisciplinary knowledge. Take this one too. Using technology to enhance research in humanities, <laughs> in humanities and social sciences. This one is going to be very relevant. The I will fix that. The intersection of humanities and computing. This is another one. I think that's a good that's a good start. So we, um, I'm going to go back into the slideshow now. Um, and so here's what here's what some of you have said um, in terms of definitions of digital liberal arts. Uh, using technology to create interdisciplinary knowledge. That interdisciplinary piece is indeed very important. Uh, using technology to enhance research in the humanities and social sciences. I think that's actually a pretty, pretty good one, pretty close to the one I'm going to suggest. Um, the intersection of humanities and computing definitely uh, comes up when I, in a little bit of research I did on this. And indeed, that's where a lot of the history comes in. Uh, an interdisciplinary curriculum using online learning tools. Well, that's interesting, too, because uh, this idea of online learning tools and what they are and what they might do is, um, is certainly part of all this. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide here. This is one of my favorite pictures that, to me, illustrates the digital humanities really beautifully. What you have a picture of here is a, a Jesuit priest uh, named Roberto Busa. Uh, and you can see by his attire that he is very different than the than the people that are watching what he's explaining. And you see in the background the IBM logo. So what he did was um, in the 1940s create a computer-generated concordance to Thomas Aquinas's writings, known as the Index Thornisticus, I believe is how you say it. And um, I, uh, I this this is again. I'm, I just have to have the caveat here that I'm by no means an expert in the historical development of digital humanities and digital liberal arts. Um, I just wanted to to put it in the historical context that it has been around for a while, or or, or you know it being um, this intersection. I think that somebody wrote of humanities and computing and. Whether this is truly the beginning or not would take a lot more research on my part, but I, I think it's a really good illustration. Um, certainly, it's been around a lot longer in the bigger universities than it is in these and little uh, liberal arts colleges such as Ursinus and some of the ones many of you work at. Um, I it first sort of became something here at Ursinus in um, 2000. I want to say 2013. I was on this original digital humanities um, working group when there was a lot of talk, a lot of ideas thrown around, but nothing really got off the ground. And nothing really started to um, bloom here until Meredith Goldsmith, who's an English professor, um, came back from a year at Duke University as a fellow at the Humanities Writ Large program. And then at the same time, the college hired a medievalist with a digital humanities 
focus. Um, so, so that's what's really been uh, kicking the digital liberal arts here at Ursinus into a higher gear. So back to um, the development, so, so with, with BUSA, let's say BUSA is at least the, the beginning of it, right, 1940s, the mainframe, big mainframe computers, um, and then pretty soon after that other scholars begin using them to automate tasks like word searching, sorting, and counting, so it becomes very important in linguistic studies. Um, and you know you had much faster processing information, so people were trying to do this work using index cards, just like in libraries, right? We had card catalogs, right, that that helped us find stuff, and then the technology comes around and allows us to do all sorts of different things with it. Um, I just I have a little anecdote to in terms of um, how computers sort of change the questions you can ask too, in, in any discipline. And I, my son was visiting campus with me on Friday, and I took him over to see a friend of mine who's in the physics department. And he showed us his lab, and there was the part where the lasers were, and the, they shoot the lasers here, and you gather all this data, and you isolate the atoms. But the other big part of his research is the supercomputer that he built. Um, and what that allowed him to do was calculations that would not even be humanly possible, right? So he, I, I asked him, so give me a scale about this, right? And he said, well, I can teach my students to do these type of calculations in a matrix, and I can give them, I usually give them like a three by three matrix to do this kind of calculation. And what, you know, the computer can do, and, and maybe if they're a really good student, they can do like a nine by nine matrix or something like that. But what the computer can do is like a 2,000 by 2,000 matrix, right? So, and it can do it, you know, much faster than, than anybody. So it changes the whole scope of what's even possible to ask. And you'll see a little bit later on that what the digital humanities, digital liberal arts is sort of trying to get people to do is think about the, the way we do humanities and social science research in a, in a totally different way. Um, so a couple of continuing on with history a little bit more. Um, uh, you get, you know, decades that followed, you get archaeologists, classicists, historians, literary scholars, and a broad array of, array of humanities researchers and other disciplines applying all these emerging computational methods to transform humanity scholarship. So, you know, as soon as the new technologies come up, their humanities people are using them. They don't get a lot of press, I guess, but they're doing it. And the first specialized journal was Computers and Humanities in 1966. So, and then a lot of you have probably heard or, or may have heard about texting, the text encoding initiative that launched in 1987. This led to the XML language, um, yeah, hypertext, nonlinear. I remember when I was in college, people were all very excited about hyperlinks and how they could lead to nonlinear narratives and things like that. Um, in the 90s, you get major digital text and image archives at centers of humanities and computing in the U.S., um, which, um, like such as the Women Writers Project and the William Blake Archive. And um, okay, this is my Wikipedia, right? Like a arguably part of the whole digital humanities thing, um, says that it became a term in um, 2000. It says the term digital humanities instead of using um, using anything else for it, um, became a term in 2004 when um, these authors came up with something called a companion to the digital humanities to try to prevent this sort of field as it became, came, as it was coming to be seen, a field in and of itself as being viewed as just simply digitization. Um, so I, that's my little spiel about the, the sort of history of, of um, digital humanities, digital um, liberal arts. So when we come to how I would define it, I, I found an art, a great article, which I'll, I'll pull up in a second, because, you know, trying, um, getting beyond the digital humanities. So, and actually the article is called Stop Calling It Digital Humanities. And this author says, you know, it's really just an umbrella term for many kinds of technologically enhanced scholarly work, and it's been gaining traction since the early 2000s, right? Um, but it's only, like I said, more recently that it's come it's in re reaching colleges like us because as technology changes, it becomes more possible for even little colleges like us to, to do things with it. 
Um, so what is digital liberal arts then, right? I would say that it's the digital humanities, that umbrella term for enhanced scholarly work, plus an enhancement of the core methods of an ideal liberal arts education. So Panna Packer argues that it's not even, like, it isn't really its own, a, a separate thing. Um, another way I thought that was useful to think of it is, like, digital liberal arts or digital humanities uses humanities methods to study digital objects, right? But also it uses digital technology to study humanities objects. So you have the kind of two things all coming together under the umbrella. I am going to come out of this presentation real quick for a minute and pull this up as well. This is that article in the Chronicle. Um, I'm going to scroll up. Um, if you guys have subscriptions at your at your institutions, um, stop calling it digital humanities and nine other strategies to help liberal arts colleges join the movement, um, which I thought was an interesting subtitle, right? Though the movement's been going on for quite some time, so you know liberal arts colleges and small colleges such as ourselves should should kind of be able at this point with advances in technology to join it, right, and be able to do things on there. Um, and here's where he says. Um, you know, stop calling it digital humanities or worse, DH with a knowing air. The backlash against the field has already arrived. The DHers have always known that their work is interdisciplinary. So someone mentioned that in one of their dis um, definitions. Um, but many academics who are not humanists think they are excluded from it, right? So that's the kind of problem with, with calling it digital humanities. And that was a problem here is that, well, can we include the media and communications department in our discussions about this? Can we include um, any other social science, a sociologist, right, in this kind of discussion of, of these discussions of what we're, we're having on campus? Um, it's a, so I would recommend that article if you have a chance. Um, let's go back to slideshow. So my a little outline of what I think of it, what has digital liberal arts, what 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 are the major qualities of it, right? Well, and it has to do with having its project-based work, very very collaborative by nature. In fact, I it's it's very hard to do alone. Um, and I want to say something about that because something about this came up just this morning, like project-based work means that there really should be a project team and ideally there could be a project manager um, with that because one of the problems with this kind of things is if you have project-based work but no manager, no person in charge, then what happens all, if, if you even get through the project, right, then how does it get to be sustained? Um, of course, there's a technology uh, component. It is by nature interdisciplinary. In fact, that's what it is at its ideal. Um, product is typically not a research paper or anything more traditional um, like that. And students are often required to present the product that work, right, um, to a larger audience, whether it's online, putting it out on the web, or putting it, like, even just locally, presenting it out wider than just the class. Um, I know some of the courses here, and I'll talk about this a little more later, require uh, students in digital humanities type classes to present at the, at the college's uh, celebration of student achievement at the sort of undergraduate conference it has every year. Interestingly enough, too, also one of the, one of the really interesting um, qualities of DLA is that it has a, a, a local focus often in, in that you can, like, use of the college's special collections and archives can be a really big component of a digital liberal arts project. And again, more on that a little bit later. And, and for us, for our purposes, the library and information technology resources are truly often indispensable. You can't do these types of projects without the support that both the library and um, IT can 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 offer and, and needs to offer, and that might mean in, in your libraries um, trying to change the focus of some people's jobs. Um, for example, here when we had um, a great interest in GIS, geographic information systems, and getting projects with that going, we had to uh, change the focus of one of our librarians' work to include. Um, becoming knowledgeable about GIS. So 
um, those are the qualities of, of DLA that for me, for here, for, that seem to me to be in all of the literature and all the, the talk about it, but are also particularly important and true here at Ursinus. So I'm going to pull up a little survey um, here. It's like a poll just to kind of take a break and sort of hear from where you are. So I'm going to ask you guys this question of do you have a digital liberal arts or digital humanities initiative on your campus? And if you can just say yes or no or not sure, right, it's like maybe We've got almost everybody voted. Another couple seconds. This is interesting. All right, I'm going to close the poll. Any last second votes? I'm going to share it. So as you can see, um, it looks like 47, or like about half of the people on here say that there isn't anything, uh, while 35% are saying yes. And I, I find it interesting people to say that it's not sure whether whether it's, there could be there could be projects, but it hasn't coalesced into like an initiative on campus to really support and promote digital liberal arts. Um, and uh, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see as we get into the question section at the end, perhaps we can talk more about what's going on at, at your guys' campuses. So, all right, so I think if I hide this, So is my screen back on there now? Nope. Yeah, okay. So now I'm going to move into talking about what's going on here at Ursinus College um, with digital liberal arts. And I want to thank if, uh, Christine Iannicelli for uh, who is a member of that group. She's a, um, our instructional technology librarian here. Um, she has sent me the what the Digital Liberal Arts Working Group has sort of come up with as its mission for, for how to promote it because there has been a real push to get this uh, created. We, we probably won't ever be a big enough school to have like a digital liberal arts like institute or a center for digital liberal arts or anything like that, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a, um, uh, you know, that, that we can't have a momentum around it, like a, a real cohesion around wanting to have a digital liberal arts program here. And I'm hoping that's true for some of you at, at TCLC schools, whether there, there isn't one, which seems to be the majority of attendees here, or um, there is, but you're not really involved in it, or something like that. So Basically, the Digital Liberal Arts Working Group at Ursinus, which we'll call DLA at UC, wants to promote conversation between the liberal arts and 21st century technologies. I like this because it, that, that conversation term, that's a conversation between the liberal arts and the 21st century technologies is what fascinates me about how we are thinking about it here. Um, that it really is not, you know, some kind of standardized thing or a standardized, or, or even maybe easily definable, right? But that we can think about our liberal arts philosophy, what that means for us as a college, and how that's intersecting with technology so they can inter um, go together in, in some kind of interesting way. And the group has five aims. Um, and the first as they say, the foster experimental thinking and understanding. And what's interesting to me about this and what's important to me about this being sort of the first listed one is that nowhere is like technology mentioned, right? Nowhere is that um, put, said there. It's, it's really all about a sort of different way of thinking, right? A different way of understanding both for students and, and for faculty members. As you'll see that first sub-bullet is about 
um, bridging a divide between the um, teacher and the scholar, right? The, 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 the researcher and the, the pedagogical improvements that can be made by using types of technology and introducing different kinds of projects that students can do that are just as sort of rigorous, right? Just as rigorous in a scholarly way, but that um, bridge the, the, the divide between um, uh, the, the teacher and the scholar, right? So we can expose students more directly to the subject area um, and it's exper experiential in terms of unveiling the method and the messiness, right? So that we are not just expecting to see a finished product at the end of a, a digital liberal arts course or pro um, project that, you know, part of the learning experience and part of what should be documented is that this isn't like a straightforward path, right? I just, I, I do my research and then I produce a research paper or I give a presentation, right? It's like, oh, well, we tried to do this first and then we, the technology didn't work or we started with this question, but when we realized what the technology could do, we could change the question to this other thing, right? And then do something different. Um, and um, this idea of creating a culture of accessibility is very important in digital liberal arts. These products, like I said, are meant to be shared. So it really is more than just the sort of, let's put technology and, and liberal arts together, it really is trying to ex expand the ways of thinking. And I, again, I was just very struck by visiting um, my physics professor friend's lab and realizing that that's kind of what's happening there, right? He can ask totally different questions because of the computations that, that computers can do allow for that. So the second aim is the supporting the integration of digital technologies into planning of courses um, and uh, research and teaching um, so that we would, this, the, this group, this working group will want to provide training and help to students, faculty and staff to acquire the necessary like information, acquire the necessary uh, things they need to be able to use the tools effectively. Right? Uh, a lot of you have probably heard about digital literacy or think about it yourselves in your own jobs, kind of related to information literacy, right? So we see that digital liberal arts is, is, is dovetailing in some ways with, with information literacy too through this. Um, so the third aim of this group is to advance the digital liberal arts beyond traditional disciplinary boundaries. Again, that's this sort of interdisciplinary, like meta-disciplinary, whatever we want to call it. Um, this idea of creating bridges for genuine interdisciplinary thinking and collaboration. Again, that ex necessary expansion of the term from digital humanities to digital liberal arts is less exclusive, right? It's, that doesn't like exclude, you know, a scientist and a and a and a historian from from partnering together to maybe co-teach a course where the end product is an exhibit about the history of science, right? So, um, and this interesting of balancing, uh, of this idea of balancing practical and theoretical skills and concerns um, involved in digital work, right? It is sometimes it's just the, depending on the project, it's just the, the I have to sit and digitize this the sort of I don't know if, if uh, I'm going to call it tedium. Let's call it tedium. The sort of tedious work of digitizing a bunch of materials so that then you can manipulate them on on um, uh, on a website or on an, in a digital exhibit or put them together in an interesting way. So it is it's sort of practical. You also need theory, right? Theory behind many things, right? The history, if you're studying history, well, you need all of that, but then you also need like, okay, well, how do I put an exhibit together, right? So it becomes much broader uh, in scope than a lot of traditional classes tend to be. Um, the fourth aim here is to document and promote digital initiatives on campus, right? So it re really does want to make these contributions visible, right, become a, a presence on the campus and like what, what to show sort of what the liberal arts are, right, you can do it more broadly through using digital tools and digital methods, right, and I, I'm glad that this 
this, this second one is in here with collaborating with library and IT to support faculty and student projects. Library and IT are, are crucial to so many of these projects. And um, I will say that sometimes <laughs> this just, just came up this morning in the sense of sometimes like a student will want to do a project and will submit a proposal, even working with a faculty member, and will sort of forget to talk to the librarian or the archivist or the IT person that they need to involve in the project. So again, I go back to this, this skill that would sort of necessarily be developed through digital liberal arts of a little bit of project management, right, the necessary um, skill to be able to bring people together and, and, and coordinate a project that takes, you know, over time. And the fifth aim, and this is not something that I have that I by any means always see as a part of digital liberal arts or digital humanities, though, though it's related, it is to encourage um, open source and open access where possible and practical. Um, open access is of course a movement in and of itself at the, um, at the recent TCLC conference. There was the uh, great presentation on open educational resources and how those are taking, taking off, um, especially at community colleges. Um, but this is where our, our Ursinus people have decided, well, we are committed to making this stuff openly accessible for you know, other scholars, for people who might be interested in the, um, in the, um, in the college and the history and the project. Um, it's also true that um, part of it is to make sort of new pedagogical approaches open access, shareable, right? Because at its best, right, well, and TCLC as a cooperative, we are trying to, to improve learning for all students everywhere, right? So this is something that, that the DLA working group here put in here very deliberately. Um, so, so that's like, that's the U UC's um, current approach to digital liberal arts. And um, the other uh, part of that was they had some students get together and think about this. And the students actually wrote a white paper about what they thought um, could, that the student could do or what, what um, the, 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 what they thought the students could do to be able to support the digital liberal arts here and one of them was to create some digital liberal arts fellows meaning students who would be trained in particular technologies maybe TEI and XML or maybe um, I don't know, like maybe they would get trained in GIS and they would be available to partner with faculty to help them integrate a digital liberal arts kind of component into the class um, so there, and there are students who are definitely interested in this kind of thing. The students also thought that a microgrant program for faculty to include a digital element in their classes would be would encourage more faculty to do this, and um, they could then the digital liberal arts fellow would then, as part of this microgrant program, you know, work with the faculty member to develop a new course or to integrate something into the course that would make it sort of qualify as digital liberal arts. And then, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that camp events or been to that camp. Um, there are sort of informal humanities and technology kinds of conferences where people get together for a day, maybe two, and talk about whatever the people decide should be on the agenda. It's very kind of open and collaborative and interdisciplinary and people are, it's really, really about sharing information, rather less about like, listening to somebody like talk and 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 give a presentation and more about getting together and collaborating learning from each other sharing new tools different ways to use these new technology tools i know for me like like uh, a new technological tool will come along and it's pretty neat, you know, but i don't know what to do with it, right? I don't know how to use it. And so that's what those backcam events are meant to be and the students came up with this idea that it would be great to have a that camp event type here uh, um, where faculty are sharing with each other what they're doing and coming up with new ideas and things like that. So we'll see if this stuff happens. That, that's kind of what's in the works for, for um, happening. So now I just wanted to, to go through a few of the classes that we've, we've been able to offer as a college um, that are, I would qualify as, truly, you know, digital liberal arts kinds of classes. 
This one is an English 300 level class called Mapping American Literary Realism in Place. It's, off, it's being offered now, taught by Professor Goldsmith, that English professor who went down to Duke for the year on a, on a Humanities writ large fellowship. Um, and you can read um, what it's about, but basically it's exploring matters of space and place in late 19th century American fiction using literary theory as well as geographic information systems mapping. So put the literary, take the literary theory, the humanities sort of liberal humanities approach, and you put it together with GIS, which is um, you know a, a, the most techie technology you can have, I think, and, and see what you get. Um, and we'll see uh, these these projects. I think the final projects are in um, in process right now. Um, but I like this statement too. Students will develop a digital project as well as traditional argumentative essays. Right. So it's it's still keeping the traditional, but but expanding what that means. The next one is a more typical sort of environmental applications of GIS. So again, learning GIS. Um, but it's an ENV class, it's an environmental studies class, um, and this one is taught by a, a professor in the in, in, in the ENV department, excuse me, and it's more typical like, hey, you're learning GIS in this class, right? Um, but what I mentioned about it being often very local and the, pro um, the prospect of having um, digital liberal arts projects that are quite um, unique to each campus. It says in the middle here, the class will culminate in student projects including data collection and analysis, analysis leading towards the creation and preservation of a set of environmental data relevant in some way to Ursinus. Like that's, that's the cool thing here, right? It's going to be completely unique. It's going to be relevant to Ursinus and it, it will be interesting to others outside of Ursinus because of it being unique to Ursinus, but it's also something that is purely local. Um, so let me go on to the next one. And I want to say, you see the, the room is highlighted in green. Notice that this one and the English one were in Marin Library Room 201. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But this one is now taking the GIS. It's another ENV class and saying ecological change and historical perspective. GIS isn't mentioned, I don't think, in this, but um, I believe this is the one where they're using GIS as a sort of um, central component to, to the class um, in talking about approaches found in environmental history, historical ecology, and historical geography, right? And again, the local focus in the eastern United States. And this is my favorite. Um, this one was taught in the fall and will be taught again was very successful, so it will be taught again for the next two falls as Ursinus uh, prepares for its sesquicentennial celebration. And um, it is actually very local and very practical. They are creating um, digital history projects that tell the story of Ursinus College. And students will explore the Ursinus Siena archive as they build these projects, get feedback from guest speakers, experience in digital public history as they work. Um, so they will um, explore a range of technologies, use an academic nonprofit and business context and begin to develop their own professional digital presence, right? And as you'll see this last sentence here, ultimately student projects will feature in the tw college's 2019 sesquicentennial celebration, right? And this one, there's no prerequisites, first year students could do this. And it very heavily involved our college archivist, Carolyn Weigel, and our digital our metadata um, and scholarly communications librarian, Andy Prock. And I'm going to, again, leave the presentation just to, because I want to show how we did this. So they, they used Omeka, or Omeka, um, sorry, they used Omeka, which is an online exhibition tool, I would call it. But what we did was we archived all of the metadata in, in our digital commons. Well, Andy did this. So you can see that these projects, they, the students came up with are here. They're part of college history. Um, we have a Bears Make GSA 
history. Uh, two students looked at the history of gender and sexuality alliance at Adder Sinus, which was which was a, it has a really kind of interesting history here. Um, they looked at it through newspapers and things like that. This group of students did one on breaking ground, a history of construction, destruction, and renovation at Ursinus College. And this was um, Ursinus remembers experience and memory in the face of tragedy where they were looking at re reactions on campus to Pearl Harbor in September 11, 2001. Um, and so what happens here is if you click into it, we have metadata about the project, but you would link over still into the Omega site for the actual um, site itself. So there's a lot of writing involved, right? They did a lot of research and historical um, um, research into the into the history of the college, but they are also then they digitized a lot. Spent a lot of time digitizing things, and they spent um, time adding in descriptions about the about the um, It's just jumped over to the other project, but they I spent a lot of time adding the projects in and adding the adding the metadata in. So it was a very practical project, but also a very um, um, one that was meant sort of po posterity, right? So let me go up. I'm gonna now. I just wanted to do a, a more of a fun poll um, based on which class would you take. Uh, so I'm going to pull up the poll, uh, hold on one second, about which one you would, oh, how do I do it? So I'm going to launch that poll and it just ask you of the four that I talked about which one you might be interested in taking. I'll just give it a couple more seconds. So it's about 80% of you voting, and it showed um, the mapping literary realism run out with a, a 50% of you would do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to like literature. So I would probably, well, either that or the bears make history. But as you can see, there's a sort of wide range of things here that, that are coming on, um, becoming available. So now let me just Okay, so last, I, so I want to go quickly through a couple other things where I told you I'm the co-director of the Teaching and Learning Institute, and I will say that one of the ways the, that we do support or try to support this is through these little TLI grants. They're only $500 a piece, but some they have encouraged some faculty to uh, include a new technology into their course. And as you'll see, there's a number of things that the students uh, uh, that the grants can be used for, but one of them being integrating a new technology into a course, and there have been several that we gave out to do this. Um, and there's also, they also do support course-related partnerships with, um, with faculty members here and at other institutions. So some of the things that TLI uh, has supported are, um, for a film studies class, the professor wanted to have the students recreate the fam famous film scenes um, for an assignment. And so we supported the purchase of iPads for that project. Um, sociologists wanted to incorporate the use of podcasts in her class, right? So that we, they're doing weekly podcasts that are going out to their uh, fellow students and others. Um, and we also have um, in MCS, we have an introduction to new media, which I would qualify as a digital liberal arts course. It's exploring relationships between social change and emerging media. And what's interesting to me is you're constructing and analyzing digital media and interactive web-based content. And projects are going to include the production of podcasts, websites, idea maps, blogs, and other new media forms. So that's kind of inherently, and again, inherently um, um, 
involving technology, and again, if you expand the term to digital liberal arts from digital humanities, it becomes um, more, uh, it, that kind of thing can be incorporated as well. And we do have a couple of summer fellows project, as I mentioned earlier, involving archival research, but again, so sometimes the students sort of forget to, to uh, talk to the librarians that they're going to need to use uh, in their projects as well. So I did want to um, uh, briefly say, for those of you who are at the, the TCLC conference, like you saw our poster, Christine and I did a poster, but space is important. We need the kind of good rooms to be able to really have a good collaborative digital liberal arts class. They involve a lot of discussion, less lecture, right? So one, one of the things we did in the library, kind of in a, in a rogue sort of way, we just sort of had the room and we, we got some new chairs and, and incorporated, all my, put a lot of whiteboards up. We got a um, TV uh, that projects and that kids can um, all, we have this wireless projection system in there that kids can can project their own um, phones or or um, computers on that and share things, right? So that's important. And if you have a space that you can offer in the library for this kind of thing, it can it can really help. And that's just some pictures from that poster that we had at the conference, and uh, what it what it actually looks like and what it can look like. Um, I wanted to stop here for a couple minutes. I really we're getting close to the end, so I want to make sure I talk a little bit about the TCLC thing. Do any of you have any questions at the moment about DLA at Ursinus that I could that I could address? Um, and I think Michael's gonna sort of look in the chat session and see and see if any come in. Um, and I'll wait a couple minutes while while uh, to see if to see if we have some questions. Diane, I kind of have a question for you. Sure. Do you, do you, I, I understand the dialogue about moving from digital humanities to digital liberal arts. Was there ever a discussion about broadening it out even further than just limiting to liberal arts? Um, not yet. I wonder what what it what, what it would be. What would be beyond that? Um, you mean so that it could include the sciences as well? Yeah, just so it's not restrictive at all. Yeah, not not yet here. I, I think that the way, because liberal arts does, for us, for the way our scientist thinks about things, you know, liberal arts does include everything, right? It's, it means that you get a broad spectrum education in the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences. So it, it shouldn't limit um, it shouldn't limit to, like, it shouldn't exclude the sciences either, though I think we still struggle with that at the moment in terms of getting interest in from, from the scientists in this kind of thing. Uh, but if you can think of a term, that would be great. I would love to know. <laughs> great. Uh, so we have some questions coming in. Uh, here's another question that came in. Uh, do you feel that the library is or can be a leader in digital learning arts, or is the library still in a position of reacting to the teaching and research interests of faculty and students? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And so <laughs> the answer is sort of a yes on both accounts. I've actually thought a lot about this. Um, the, um, I think that the library can and should absolutely be a leader in starting the conversations about liberal arts, in developing the expertise about about digital liberal arts, about digital humanities, and, and like developing expertise in new and emerging technologies, if possible, you know, getting some kind of knowledge of GIS, which is the big thing right now, at least for us. Um, and so with that, you know, trying to get the word out through whatever methods of communication the library has, right? On the other hand, right, like, we can't do it by ourselves. And so I, my approach has just been the minute I would hear anything about liberal arts, like, a, like digital liberal arts, like a, a working group or a, just a conversation or you know, a, I heard about a professor using a technology in an interesting way. Like I would sort of grab onto that, right, and then and then just 
make sure that the library is always at the center of that conversation so that then it becomes it's it's sort of like you're kind of leading from where you are you know what I mean so that you get um, you're part of it but you're also uh, you kind of are dependent on some of the professors developing the classes that are doing it I'm hoping that answers the question um, because it, it really is a matter of, of like of both and being just really a, open to uh, hearing about all this stuff um, that's that's already going on. Okay. Uh, we, we have an interesting question here um, to pivot just a bit. Can you discuss a bit um, why the local emphasis is mentioned in digital learning arts projects? Uh, you know, there are, sev there are several potentials offered by digital tools and, and networked access to allow research to arrange more widely than ever. So why, why the limit to just the local sphere? Ah, I didn't mean to imply that it was like purely limited to, to local sphere. I have, I, um, I think that it's, the reason I put it there is that I think it's actually a strength of of what small colleges can do. Um, and and I, I you know I could be I could sort of be wrong on this, but like that that bears make history course right is is getting the kids into using primary source documents, learning about like a skill of how to digitize, how to kind of categorize, how to create um, create metadata right. Um, about it and and it's sort of locally useful to the college but then it's also out there on the World Wide Web so it's it's creating like unique knowledge that doesn't exist anywhere else right and so um, and so then it brings some 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 PR to the college as well and um, so I but I, I do I take that very, I mean that point that you can actually collaborate among things, and and actually, if I if we can hold the question, any more questions for one thing, I I think this could be a good segue into what I have been thinking about and why I wanted to what I wanted to bring up to conclude this presentation is is there potential for TCLC DLA? Now, admittedly, that's relatively local in that you know TCLC is a pretty small organization, but this is where that um, that ease of collaboration really really um, uh, can come into play, right? So this came up because I was talking up to I think it was Kathy Fennell and about the grants committee and what kind of grant opportunities were out there. And you know we have the Clear Hidden Collections grant um, that is a tries to get um, really really unique things that don't exist anywhere out out onto the World Wide Web and there's some NEH grants that are still uh, out there for digital humanities types of projects and when I was talking like could we do something that was TCLC right um, that I would categorize I would again I would call it sort of digital liberal arts I mean it's a digital project right but you know and we when we were talking about this I met with Ann Upton and we talked well it would need to have sort of academic or historical interest right we wouldn't want to just I don't know, create a website or something like that, right? But um, what? It, it, but and if it had a sort of thematic quality to it, so one of the reason, one of the ways TCLC might think about doing this is, hey, we're an organization that consists of colleges within a 50-mile radius of City Hall, right? So this could be of interest to the broader Philadelphia region, right? If we could get enough TCLC libraries to participate in a project that's framed around this geographical fact. Right. Um, the other other ideas, and these are not my own. They came up from discussions at board of directors meetings and stuff like that. Was somebody had suggested, well, cooperation. Right. CCLC is a cooperative. Like, what is the future of cooperation for small schools? What would it look like in the future? Could we create some kind of digital project around that? Um, and uh, somebody else had suggested, well, change. You know, how has higher education changed at small schools in the Philadelphia region over the life of TCLC's years? because um, it's sort of this overlooked history, I think. You know, we hear a lot about the temples and the Drexels and the Pens and all the big the big ones, but, you know, the smaller schools like those that are in TCLC aren't, um, aren't uh, 
you know, don't get a lot of press, I guess I would say. Somebody suggested, well, hey, TCLC started in 1967. You could do some kind of project around how did TCLC schools participate in conversation and events related to the, all the social change that was happening then. And, you know, another idea was that there's all these sort of unique special collections at TCLC, right? Could we create an exhibit or do some kind of research using special collections, right? And what might all of them collectively tell us about the region? Um, they're just are sort of very like I don't know, sort of new ideas, right? I, they haven't been very fleshed out much, um, but we did talk about it at the March Board of Directors meeting last year. And these were I'll leave this up. I'll leave this slide up. But these were some of the um, these were some of the concerns or ideas that came up. Um, so. Um, I, I guess that's just a, a, a long way of saying that it doesn't have to be local, but like the, the more local and relevant it can be to students, right, it, it's sort of the more engaged they tend to get both with the project, with your university or college, with your, um, with your actual materials that they can go get their hands on, right, in some ways, with in, in terms of, of maps, you know, like maybe the environmental impact, you know, being mapped. So, I hope that 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 answers the question. Also, also gets in there a little bit about what I'm interested in, what TCLC as an organization might be able to do. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I see that we're we're uh, running low on time. Uh, but I think this is a good segue to, to a question that came in as we think about um, digital liberal art projects that TCLC or individual institutions can do. Uh, just in your opinion, what are some of the characteristics or factors that make the difference between having students participate in what is essentially a digitization project and yes. performing technology enhanced scholarship? Yeah, also a very, very good question um, because we you know, we really don't want to, you know, um, I guess I would call it like take advantage of students, right? Like if they're getting course credit, but they're like just, you're just using them to sort of digitize stuff. Like I think digi getting, giving students jobs in the library to digitize stuff is, is a good thing, but how do we make sure that this, this academic element is, is, is in there? And I think, um, uh, you know, one of the ways to do that is that they have to spend some time developing or, you know, studying whatever theoretical framework that, that would be relevant, right? Um, so if we go back to TCLC, like if we were going to look at diversity in TCLC schools, right, in 1967, like they would need to do quite a bit of research on the wider, like on in the world, the national scale, right? Um, and get um, then come down and do some history more and sort of in particular in this region, right? So before they would even get to, you know, the technology part, they would have to be doing that. And I think that's just really important um, so that you don't end up taking advantage of students and just making them digitize stuff, right? Is like that there's, there's um, whatever sort of theoretical or disciplinary framework um, it needs to be sort of first, it needs to come first, and then we kind of look at the technology and see how that technology might be able to change the questions we ask, might be able to get us to think about things in a different way, right? Um, but it's a good question and it's, it's an important one. And Diane, just one more, as, and I think it's a good segue here, as we uh, approach the end of our webinar today. I know you talked a little bit about some of the fellowships that you have to, to encourage faculty participation, but as we think about all these great projects that our institutions can be working towards, is there any advice or tips on creating a new digital liberal arts library position and how might that position integrate with you know, other centers for teaching and learning or teaching and learning institutes on each campus? Ooh. That's a good question. You, I guess you mean like, on on each local on a local campus to have a digital or a liberal arts librarian or something like that. Is that the gist of the question? I, I think so. Yes. Okay. Um, 
how that's awesome. <laughs> like right now we have at our sinus we created this position of an instructional technology librarian, which may be true for, for some of some of you may have something like that, but this is even more um, expansive, I think, um, in terms of uh, like what the kind of expertise you would either look for in hiring this vision or look for this a person in this position to develop um, that they would not only be able to learn things like become sort of expert at GIS and maybe TEI and some other kinds of things that I'm blanking on right now. It's like the XML and things like that, right? Um, but they could also um, be looking and researching and responsible for looking at new, like entirely new pedagogical forms, right, that come out of, 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 of the expansion of technology and things in, into the classroom and different kinds of projects that could do. What, what that position could really do is, is be a true advocate for all sorts of things and put the library at this, in this sort of central place, right, in the conversation where I think it absolutely belongs, right, and that person could be a liaison between all different disciplines, right. My, my, one of my favorite things about the library is it is by nature interdisciplinary or metadisciplinary or whatever, right? We don't we don't have those disciplinary walls in the library. And that that kind of position would be so ideally a person in that position would be ideally suited. You have to go out to the scientists and say, hey scientists, look what's going on over here in this English class. Look what's going on over here in this this uh, sociology class, right? And and get those people talking to each other. And get those people like give those people some ideas to spark them to get working, and maybe even serve as that necessary sort of project manager in some cases, right? Like you want, like you need a person leading these projects. You need a person who's going to see the project from beginning to end, and then beyond the end of the project to the sustainability of it. So I love that idea. That's a great idea. I'm going to suggest that to somebody here at Ursinus. So. <laughs> Well, I see that it's just past three o'clock today. I want to thank Diane for this thought-provoking presentation. I know we're probably all going to head back to our libraries and institutions with some great ideas. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, and just know that and look for uh, a recording of this webinar on TCLC's YouTube channel in the near future. Again, Thank you, everybody, and as we end our session today, uh, I want to encourage everybody to fill out the evaluation. So once again, Diane, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to TCLC, and thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you.